Am I speaking loud enough? Yeah. Okay. So. I'm going to talk to you. My presentation is going to be very different from Erica's. I only wish, I, in a prior lifetime, I actually was a photographer. So <laughs> that's what I wanted to do initially before I went to university. So I have tons of photographs, none of which are in this actual presentation. So I'm going to give a pretty different presentation talking about the future of, uh, of the field of criminal justice, but more, more broadly about uh, the justice industry, uh, more broadly speaking than that. Um, Again, as, as mentioned, I'm a professor of criminology and criminal justice at Northeastern University. And I'm going to tie the way I speak about this to mentorship. I know that that's one of the goals of this particular convening. And I can say in so many ways as I talk through um, sort of my own trajectory, but also um, my sort of dual lives as a faculty member and an administrator um, at the university, that my success has entirely been based on really strong mentor relationships that I have and continue to maintain both with my own mentor and with my, now with my mentees, my students at, um, at Northeastern. So I wanted to talk a little bit, give you a little bit of uh, back, my background because I think it tells a little bit of the story of how I ended up where I am today as um, an associate dean at the college at, um, back in Boston at Northeastern. Uh, I am, obviously I have um, a family. I'm one of four children. I'm actually the second daughter of three daughters and a, a younger brother. We were originally from England and moved to the United States when I was uh, seven years old. And my parents moved to the US entirely so we could have educational opportunities, which will become important because I'm the only child of their four who took advantage of that. <laughs> and I never stopped taking advantage of it. Um, so my parents were a product of England and they um, both were uh, born in the 40s, where by in the old English system, it's not actually very true anymore. But back then, when you were a very young child, they decided what track you would go on, right? You were either going to go on a track that would send you in the direction of going to college, or the very few, or on the track that would have you finish school at 16 and go into the trade. And so both of my parents were put on the trade track, and my father ended up in the printing and publishing industry. He did very well for himself, but he, he doesn't even have the equivalent of a high school education, as most men of his generation didn't in England, right? You went on to trade school and ended up building a career that way. College was not um, uniformly available to everybody. And so when we were um, kids growing up in the north of England, right by Scotland, um, my parents really wanted us to have a different set of opportunities than they had. And so their goal was to come to America so that their kids could have educational opportunities that they did not see available for us, um, even in England back in that time. So this was in the, in the early 70s. And so we moved to the United States when I was seven years old. And from that point on, we moved all the time. So uh, my whole um, life until I was 18 was one of residential mobility, which is funny because that's actually what I study now among people who are incarcerated. <laughs> so a different type of mobility. Um, but we moved a lot because my father was not military. Well, he might as well have been. He worked for DuPont, and we moved every single year of my life until I was 18. I went to five different high schools, um, so graduating from the final one eventually. So. I got very used to sort of moving and, and uh, being sort of displaced over and over. And then I found stability in education, uh, which is unusual. I graduated in 1992 from San Clemente High School in California, having lived in California for three months. Right? So I had gone to two different high schools in my senior year, moved to California from the East Coast, where I had been spent most of my time, although I lived all over this country, um, and then graduated from high school there. The reason I went to San Clemente, I was already accepted to Northeastern University as an undergrad, so I got my undergraduate degree there. Um, but I was already going to college in Boston. We lived in Delaware at the time, and I thought, why not? Let's just go, I'll just go to California for my last three months. I don't really know anyone here anyway. And California sounds fun. I had actually never been to California when I left. And so I went to California knowing full well that I would end up going back to college at Northeastern. And then I started to get used to staying in one place. At Northeastern, I stayed for five years, which is the traditional Northeastern education. It's a school that's very grounded in the experiential co-op model. If you, I know this is the West Coast, so lots of people don't know Northeastern as well as people do on the East Coast. But Northeastern is a five-year undergraduate program most of the time. You don't have to do the five-year co-op model, but virtually everybody does. Um, because when I went there, it actually helps you pay for the, the university. Now, it doesn't get anything like paying for the university. It's so expensive. Um, but what you would do is you would go to school for the first year as a regular school year, and this is still the model at Northeastern. And starting in year two, you go to school for six months, then you co-op for six months right, with an employer. Then you go back to school for six months, and you co-op for six months. So I did the three-time co co-op plan, which is a five-year 
undergraduate degree. And in that time, I'll say I was a major in psychology at the time. Um, I was always interested in criminology and criminal justice, but Northeastern back then had a uh, kind of unusual, they had their own college of criminal justice separate from everything else, which was great in a way, but didn't allow you to um, explore other disciplines as much as I wanted to. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do at that time, and criminology felt really insular at, at Northeastern then. And so I went into psychology and took as many classes as, in criminology as I could, but it was at Northeastern as an undergrad that I met my first mentor, who is still at Northeastern, um, Professor Judy Hall, who is a psychology professor there. And I watched, I had always wanted to be a lawyer, and that's what I thought I was going to do, was go to law school. But I had watched her, I would watched her career. Uh, she was a mother of three children and was able to really effectively manage her sort of mother, motherhood and her work life, um, in part, I think, because she was in academia, right? Academia is a kind of an ideal place to, to have those dual roles and to be heavily involved in, in both parts of your life. And so I always admired, she, was a, she is, was, is a top researcher in, in psychology, and so I worked with her really, really closely, and she really wanted me to stay at Northeastern, do my PhD at Northeastern in psychology, but I was determined, and this would be a recurring theme, to, flee the, to sort of flee the nest <laughs> and go somewhere else. And, and I, you know, I really wanted criminology at that point, and so I said, well, you know, I, I appreciate the opportunities you've given me and, I, and your mentorship, and she's still a mentor for me now. Um, but I'm going to go on um, from here and get a PhD in criminology or criminal justice. So I applied to programs, um, direct entry into a PhD program, and ended up at the City University of New York because I'm really a city person. Um, or I was, and now I live in the country on a farm. <laughs> but uh, that's a different story. But I had lived in Boston, and I wanted to go to a different city. And so I chose New York, and I... Uh, eventually got a PhD in criminal justice there. And there I met my next mentor, who is uh, Todd Clear, who I'll talk a lot about. He's one of the most well-known correctional scholars in the country. And I really think you know, the relationship there, the pairing with a mentor in that way, is really crucial to careers, not just in academia, but in, in every way. And so I'll talk about that a little bit um, in a minute. And so in employment, I am one of those professors who went straight in from undergrad into a PhD program, straight from PhD program into academia, into a, an assistant professor role at Northeastern. But I will talk a lot about how I've engaged with, with the community and with practitioners in everything I've done. And that is largely, again, owed to my mentors who, have, who gave me a model for doing that. Uh, so I, when I first left the PhD program, the minute I graduated, Todd Clear, who was my mentor, sort of made a job for me uh, to help him run the doctoral program at CUNY, which needed a lot of work at the time. And so I took that job. Um, <laughs> but I'm surprised I still have this mentor, because about uh, maybe four months into the job that he had created, I was asked, I was approached by Northeastern School of Criminology and Criminal Justice to interview for a position that had opened up for an assistant professor there. And I wasn't really sure what to do, what decision I should make, because I just, my mentor just made this job for me. I was very happy, but I always wanted to end up back at Northeastern. So I could be a cheerleader for the school. You'll probably see that by the end of this conversation. I love Northeastern, but I also love Boston, and that's where I wanted to end up in my life. So I had thought it would be quite a way down the road. I would go away, but I was asked to interview. Um, so I talked to my mentor and said, what should I do? And he said, oh, just go, just go interview, you know, it'll be, it'll be fine. I don't think he thought I would actually get offered the job, maybe, or maybe he did and just, and, you know, knew that eventually you have to let your mentees go. Um, but I interviewed and I was offered the job, and the dean at the time, I was telling Erica this story last night, he is not the kind of person you're going to get a second chance with, right? If he offers you the job and you say no, you are not going to get that offer again while he's dean. He's just that kind of person. And so I knew I had to either... I had to go back and talk to Todd and say, look, this is an opportunity that I either take now or you know, it might change my future. And being the good mentor that he is, he said, even though he had just created this job and probably gone to a lot of effort to make this job happen, said, you just go. You go. You know, that's, it's best for you, of course, not best for me, but it's best for you to do this and for your career. And luckily, we maintain our friendship today. I thought I might ruin it. Um, and so I became an assistant professor the next year at the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Northeastern, and I'll, I want to talk a little bit about that because I think uh, criminal justice, and, and, and the second part of my talk is all about how criminal justice is a male-dominated field, but not for long, right, and I want to, especially in the academic realm, but also in the professional realm. And 
When I first got to Northeastern, and still today, I'll say even now, we have 19 faculty in the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice, four of whom are women. Um, so there are 15 men and four women, and it is a, Northeastern's a research one university, a very high pressure environment. And so I went into this environment sort of knowing that it was gonna be, a, we, we would have, I would have a tough road ahead of me. Um, nobody in the school had gotten tenure since 2000, I mean, since 1991, right? So there had been a 20 year drought in any professor, male or female, getting tenure in the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Northeastern. And when I was hired in 2005, there were seven assistant professors who were above me who had not yet gone up for tenure. Not one of them got tenure, right? So I was, it, we, it was an environment that was very stressful all the time because every year a couple of people would either go up for tenure or be told, don't bother, you should just start looking for a job because you're just not gonna get tenure here. And so they left. Um, in 2011, I broke the curse at Northeastern and I got, was the first person tenured in that school since 1991. So we all, lots of people in the field and in criminology and criminal justice, we all know each other, right? It's a very small field in terms of the number of programs that are out there, um, especially at the doctoral level. And they all joke that this curse, that the Northeastern tenure curse lasted almost as long as the Red Sox curse, which is also <laughs> infamous in Boston. Um, and I'm glad to say, I mean, I think in some ways it just required, everybody after me has now gotten tenure, right? So there have now been five other successful tenure cases and part of it was probably leadership change, right? Things that it wasn't all related to any superhuman abilities I have or anything like that. But it's just the case that you, you really needed there a lot of supports to feel like you could make it because everybody before, you didn't have any models of anyone actually making it at that, at that institution. And so, and then the minute I got tenure, I was, um, I was actually, uh, had, I was pregnant at the time. So I went on maternity leave right after I got tenure. And then as soon as I came back, with a one-year-old baby, I was asked to uh, take over um, as associate dean of the school. So largely because I have some pretty strong, hopefully I like to think, administrative capacities as well. And so that was another point at which I had to decide what I was gonna do. Because I'm very committed to my scholarship, which I wanna talk a little bit about today because it's in obviously um, field specific. But I'm also committed to making change in the field more broadly. And so I think, you know, I. The fight I'm fighting in scholarship-wise is tough, right? To end mass incarceration is tough. The fight to make change in the field of academia might be a little easier. So I want to face both of those challenges. And so I had to make a decision over whether I would do this. And making this choice obviously changes your traje trajectory. But the reason this was reasonable for me to go and sort of be the associate dean of the school was that I was still very tied into what to the, the criminology and criminal justice world, right? So I was able to maintain my research pretty, pretty easily. It was a one unit. I ran the graduate programs mostly in that unit. And so it was a pretty um, easy transition for me. Again, this was where my mentor said, well, this is just something you can do easily, right? But then last year, or this past year, I was asked by the college to be the associate dean at the college level. And that was a huge move. That is a move from running one program and being sort of enmeshed in, in academia, still still teaching, still working with students all the time, to really converting to pretty much full-time academic administration. And so then I called both of my mentors in, in my life, uh, Judy Hall, who's been my mentor since I was an undergrad, and then Todd Clear, who's um, my sort of, now my partner in most of the work I do. And I said, you know, what should I do? And they said, at this point, you have to make a decision. Like, this is a decision that is really gonna change your trajectory. If you go into this role, it, you are, you're not leaving your scholarship behind per se, but your time for scholarship is going to be drastically reduced because obviously you're running uh, however, 11, uh, seven doctoral programs, 11 master's programs, and four certificate programs, so overseeing those. So there's a lot involved, obviously. It's full-time academic administration. But I'm also a person who refuses to, <laughs> to give up on things. And so I, when I negotiated the job, I said, I'm just not giving up my scholarship. That's what I care about. I care about incarceration. I care about ending mass incarceration. I care about the research I do, which I, I do a lot of research, which I hope to talk a little bit about. And so I'm not going to give that up. And if I, need, if I have to, to take this other role, then I'm not gonna take it. And so what I negotiated was a, a kind of split where I'm 60% uh, in the academic administration and 40% in research. So I don't teach at the moment. That is the one thing, something's gotta give, right? So I don't get to teach. 
But I do maintain my research program, and, which is important because I have a lot of grant-funded research and I can't just let that go. Um, but it was really, really important to me that I keep that because I don't know that this is something I want to do forever, right? This, this role where I'm in academic administration where I know that I'll never lose my passion for the things I care about, which is justice and, and ending uh, mass incarceration. And so I've actually negotiated that role, those roles fairly well um, by being really firm about having the two roles, right? And so one of the ways that I, my mentor is always the person I turn to, both of them, but especially Todd Clear, and he said, what you, from the outset, you have to set really firm boundaries, right? And you can't be willing to give, give on those boundaries if you're gonna try to do both things. And so what I have set up, and I still have managed so far, and it's only been a few months, so I'm not gonna, you know, ask me in a few years, is I do the administration work mostly on Monday, uh, Tuesday, and Thursdays, and I intentionally work on my research on Wednesdays and Fridays. And I made the rule that I will not come in on those days. Now, secretly, I do come in, but I hide in my other office. <laughs> I have a second office on Northeastern's campus, so, and I work with uh, one of my mentees now on this research. And so I typically just don't tell anybody that I'm over on the other side of campus working on my research. I'm almost always there. Wednesdays, I'm not usually there, but Fridays, I'm there working on a different office. And so far, it's worked fairly well. Um, so I want to talk about a little, tell you a little bit about, about my scholarship. So this is the cover of our book, um, which you mentioned when you introduced. She left the, the little chair, but when you mentioned uh, when you introduced us, uh, Todd Clear and I, who is my mentor and now my closest colleague, um, wrote a book called *The Punishment Imperative*, where we argued um, something that at the time was very controversial. We argued that, and this was published in 2013, but we wrote it in 20, 2011. We argued that we might be seeing the beginning of the end of mass incarceration in this country. And I was interviewed by uh, the New York Times on that and quoted as saying that. And um, Todd called me, he's older, he's an older white male like most criminal justice professors. And he said, uh, uh, he la jokingly said, well, if we're wrong, right, because there's a very early prediction to say that, and I'll talk about why we think that, and I still think it's true. He said, if we're wrong, I'm near retirement. What the hell are you going to do, <laughs> right? Like, you're just, you just wrote a book where you might be proved wrong very early in your career. And so I laughed. That's just how he always is. Um, so my focus has always been on institutional corrections, and especially prisons. And I study both prisons as an institution and the impact of prisons on individual people's lives and on communities, and I'll talk about both of those. But in this particular book, uh, we argued that uh, we may be seeing the beginning of the end of mass incarceration, largely because of a few trends that we saw going on simultaneously at the same time. So one, we saw small, at this point, very small annual drops for the first time in 40 years in the rate of incarceration starting in 2009, really 2010. So there were really small drops, and those were important because if you were born after 1970, which many in the room were, there was never a time in your life in which incarceration in the U.S. was not increasing. It increased every single year for, close, for 39 years, right? so almost four decades. And so it was, they were pretty, it was pretty phenomenal to see those numbers drop, no matter how small, right, in the, in the year 2009, very slightly, and then more significantly in the year 2010. And then every, in every year since, we've seen overall drops in the rate of incarceration. Back in 2011, when we wrote the book, it was fairly new. That was important, but more important was the change in conversation around incarceration in the country at the time. And so we pointed to a number of things that suggested that we may be seeing a sea change in how we think about punishment. And I still think that all of these things are true, right? Crime is no longer the number one concern of people in this country. So when you watch debates and you listen to politicians back in when the first Clinton ran, right, in 1994, virtually all of the debates focused on crime and being tough on crime and what you were going to do to increase the number of police, how you were going to support the death penalty. As I'm, if, you were, if you remember that time, Bill Clinton actually left the presidential campaign trail to sign an execution warrant to show that he could be just on, as tough on crime as uh, back in Arkansas, right, where he was governor, um, just as tough on crime as the Republican candidate. And that was really what it was all about. In the most recent elections, rarely does crime come up. And when it does, it's almost always around guns, right? So guns are usually the issue that can, can come up. But crime as a problem and drugs as a problem are far less frequently talked about. And so there's been a change. 
in, in the sort of tenor around crime. People aren't as afraid of crime as they used to be. They don't articulate it as a top 10 problem. In fact, I'll say uh, in our book we use some figures which I don't have here. Um, but we showed these figures that showed throughout the 1970s, 1980s, w uh, crime and drugs were in the top five issues that Americans cared about in every one of those Gallup polls that they did, right? So what are the top five problems facing, it's usually top 10, but they made the top five. Um, problems facing America, it was always drugs and crime, drugs and crime, drugs and crime. They made it somewhere on that list, education, health, right? Those things made it too, but drugs and crime were in that mix the entire 1970s, 1980s, and into the 1990s. And then beginning in the late 1990s, once crime began to drop fairly precipitously, you started to see them drop down in importance, and since 2000, they haven't even made the top 10, right? The only exception to that is terror, terrorism, and that has made in, in certain times the top 10, but crime and drugs have not made the top 10 list of things that concern Americans. And so I think that gives politicians the room they need to breathe around the issues of crime and justice um, in ways that they did not have for almost 40 years. And so in the book, we make all of these, these arguments, um, and it's a really a book that suggests that not only that we're seeing the beginning of the end of mass incarceration, but what we need to do to get there, right? So the, the final chapter is on what are the real steps that we can take to end mass incarceration, and it's not going to be easy. So that's why I say this is the fight that's gonna take a really long time, because we didn't end up with 2.5 million prisoners, right? By, um, in a quick, it took 40 years to build that, and it'll take a lot longer to undo it unless we do some really drastic things. Although at the end of, actually not in the book, in, in an essay that followed, we mentioned in the book some of the things you'll have to do to bring incarceration rates down to where they were before this began um, are pretty drastic, right? Um, but some of the things you would have to do are not drastic at all. So if we were to just take sentences for crimes and roll them back to their 1982 level, like just suddenly say we we're gonna sentence people at what they were getting in 1982 for this very same crime, we would immediately cut the incarceration rate in half over, in a decade, right? So within one decade, you would see our incarceration in rate in half. The problem is, and this is this, the hard fight, which I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on, is if you really wanna end mass incarceration, and this is the hard sell, you have to be willing to do something with violent offenders as well, right? Because it is true that about 35% of the, the folks in, in prisons are in for violent offenses. Now those aren't all the violent offenses people think of, right? Like rape and murder. They're more likely to be the aggravated assaults, the assaults, those sorts of offenses. Um, but you would have to be willing to do something about those, and that's really the harder sell. The other work that we do, so I do a bunch of work on that, mass incarceration, how we end it, how we got here, um, how we end it, more importantly. I also have done a lot of work on the impact of incarceration on communities. And here, um, this has been mostly grant-funded research, funded by the National Institute of Justice, usually, uh, where we look at the impact of taking large numbers of offenders from certain disadvantaged communities, putting them in prison, and then cycling them back, because virtually everybody comes out of prison. Right, and so what we argue here is, and you may have heard this argument um, before, or maybe not, it's uh, Todd Clear's initial argument. He kind of sits around thinking about stuff and has these sort of blurbs of, of genius every now and then. And a long, long time ago, he thought to himself, what if incarceration is actually causing crime, right? What if it's actually increasing crime and not decreasing crime? And so he thought through the way in which that might work, and we made several arguments around it. And what he argued at the core, the core argument that we test over and over again um, to try to demonstrate that it's actually true, is that incarceration might reduce crime to a certain extent, right? So if you live in certain communities where crime is not very common, or the types of crimes that police arrest people for are not very common, then taking out the few people who are committing crime probably increases public safety in that area, right? However, if you go into some of the communities where we remove large numbers of mostly male, mostly young male, mostly young minority male, members of the community to put them in prison, as a function of doing that, you are actually probably destabilizing the community in ways that people don't think about a lot. And because you're destabilizing the community, the community is becoming less safe, not more safe, right? And so then you're increasing crime in those communities. And so we've tested this. It's called the coer coercive mobility thesis. That's why I say residential mobility has been a theme in my life, because I moved all the time for all different reasons. But we look at the movement of people into and out of prisons and how that affects the neighborhoods in which p those people live 
and how the, the, the effects of that incarceration, what we call prison cycling, might actually damage the community in ways that make crime more likely to happen, not less likely to happen. So fewer males, fewer role models, fewer people, less, in, less informal social control, way more formal social control coming into a neighborhood, generating more arrests, generating this sort of vicious cycle of, of crime and community. And so we've spent a lot of time demonstrating that there's a tipping point, and we've done, we've done this work now. It started in Tallahassee, Florida, where there was a few neighborhoods, and this is actually really interesting, because I think it's one of the, the uh, probably most interesting demonstrations. I don't have the map, but I could show you. There's a few neighborhoods in Tallahassee where on any given day, and by neighborhood we mean a very small re um, residential area, so d not defined by census tracts, but defined by what people think of as their neighborhood, right? Really small, several blocks. There were a few neighborhoods in Tallahassee where on any given day, more than half of the men, the young black men in those neighborhoods, and they were young black neighborhoods, were in prison. And that is when we started to think, what, what happens when you do that? So then, Todd, we were in New York, and we partnered with Justice Mapping, which is a, um, a organization, a nonprofit, which maps justice outcomes, right? So they use this sort of spatial analysis to look at justice outcomes. And they mapped incarceration in a couple of neighborhoods in Brooklyn, and, and particularly in um, the Brownsville neighborhood of Brooklyn. And one of the things they found was that there were, and this, this map I wish I had put in there because it would have been a pretty picture, um, but it, uh, not a very pretty picture, I should say. But what they found was in, in this analysis, <clears throat> there were blocks in Brownsville where, exact, where in one block, not a whole s series of blocks, but in one block, the city of New York spent more than a million dollars incarcerating from people from that block in that one year. And so Eric Kadora, who is one of the Justice Mapping um, founders, sat around thinking, what if you took that million dollars each year and invested it in that community? And that is where the justice reinvestment which idea was actually born. I'm not sure how many, you probably have all heard about the justice reinvestment initiatives, and if not, I'm happy to talk about them. But he, I mean, it, unfortunately, it's been a little bit perverted over the time in terms of what it turned into. But his initial idea, and when they coined that phrase, was what if we took all the money that we spent on incarceration in these really impoverished communities and fed it into the community to build capacity, community capacity for, for uh, regulating themselves. And so that, that was the idea. So we've done a lot of work on that, and we've since demonstrated uh, this same effect in Boston in our most recent work uh, in Newark, New Jersey, which is a comp more complicated story and in Trenton, New Jersey. So we did a three-site replication where we showed that indeed in those cities as well, after it seems incarceration reduces crime to a point and then at a tipping point, you start to see crime increase as you incarcerate more and more people. Then my third line of work in, in my scholarship focuses on the impact of prisons on individuals. And here, my most recent work, I've always thought about that. I've always thought about mass incarceration from the inmates' perspective. Right? I work with a lot of students who do for their dissertation work, they work with prisons and, and inmates, and they do surveys, and they you know, test theories about um, outcomes for prisoners on, under different circumstances, all sorts of stuff like that. But more recently, um, I've started to work in the uh, justice sector, really focusing on the people who work in prisons and how the environment might be affecting them. Um, and so I think, um, the next, so I'll, I'll talk about it in terms of my research, because I was literally just awarded an NIJ grant two weeks ago uh, to continue this work, a pretty big one. Um, so over my career, since I got to Northeastern, actually, I've had more than $2 million in grant, federal grant funding, for the most part, some state as well and local, which I'll talk about, um, to study some of these issues. And my most recent projects are both on correctional officers. The first one is ongoing, so we're looking at correctional officer stress. Um, it's a two-state two study, and I'm in charge of the Massachusetts piece of that project, where we're looking to try to develop an early warning system for acute stress. As it turns out, that's becoming very difficult, because the first step on that was interviewing, uh, we interviewed in Massachusetts, 350 correction officers, a random sample across eight, different, eight of the biggest facilities in Massachusetts, to sort of get a sense of the range of stress levels among the correction officers, and it turns out virtually all of them are at the high end of the scale. There's just not the range that you would find in a usual occupation, right? And so we are still hoping we might be able to develop this tool that might say when someone is under acute stress, although I'm increasingly doubtful that we'll be able to have a really refined tool for doing that. And that was going to be developed, um, NIJ funded this work, to try to develop a tool that would allow for early intervention. 
um, when, it, when officers are under, in, under acute stress situations. But doing that work led to my, the, fun, the project that just got funded literally two weeks ago. So in the course of that work, I learned through interviewing correction officers um, in Massachusetts that there had been uh, 16 suicides among correction officers in Massachusetts since 2010, which is an, there are 3,500 correction officers employed by the Department of Correction. It is a rate of suicide among COs in Massachusetts, which is eight times the national average suicide rate for men. Um, and there have been some women, so I wanna talk about that as well. And 11 times the rate in Massachusetts, because Massachusetts actually has a fairly low suicide rate relative to other states. And what, so I became really interested in that because I, in talking to the officers, and it's funny because everyone said when we wanted to interview correction officers, oh man, it's gonna be worse than inmates. Inmates are tough to work with, but correction officers are gonna, gonna be impossible. You're never gonna get them to sit down and talk to you. There, it's the, sort of the, the blue wall like you see in policing, they said. But we found, we got a 79% uh, response rate for an hour and a half long interview which was pretty amazing, um, it's a pretty long interview. We, we were able, thanks to the Massachusetts Department of Correction, to do it on site, on shift. So that made it a little bit easier to get them, <laughs> right? Because they got to get off post and talk to somebody different. And so we thought that was it, but as we talked to them, we realized they, almost to a person, brought up the suicides, right? Because they're very, very aware of the high rate of suicide among their, their fellow officers. And they always said that they were doing it because they wanted to help other officers who might be in, at, in a period of crisis. And so in the most recent round of uh, National Institute of Justice grant funding um, initiatives, they had a whole area on correctional officer well-being. It's a vastly understudied area. We know very little about correctional officers and their, their stress or well-being. Um, outcomes. We do know that their average life expectancy is 59 years old. Right? This is not just in Massachusetts, just nationwide. So they have a life expectancy that's at least 15 years younger than your average um, man in, in the United States at this time and women. And there's, again, there are a lot of women in corrections, although notably fewer than, um, there's about 10, in Massachusetts, for example, about 10% of correction officers are women. Um, and we did include them in both of our studies. Two of the suicides have been women and then the other 14 in Massachusetts have, have been men. Um, and so what we, we, we went in on for this grant under the Correction Officer Wellness making the argument that there has never yet, and this is true, there's never been a study of correction officer suicide. The studies of stress and, and wellness tend to focus on um, physical wellness and not really emotional or psychological well-being. And so we wanted to expand the work in that way as well. And so we designed a methodology which starts with the um, sort of trying to understand the suicides in Massachusetts. Um, and because one of the things we noticed as soon as we got the data on these 16 or the, the information on the 16 suicides from the department was that there were no real noticeable patterns. Right? So the suicides occurred among people who had been um, in the Department of Correction for in one case under six months all the way to a re recently retired captain who committed suicide about six months after he had retired from the, the Department of Correction and everything in between that, right? So um, there was no real pattern. There weren't really any patterns in, in rank. So we had everything from, um, from officers to sergeants to lieutenants to captains, obviously. There were no real patterns in place, although I say that um, there are two facilities in Massachusetts which have had more than their fair share of suicide. So those two have had um, one has had three and the others had four, so that's seven of the 16. But the other nine are spread across the other facilities in Massachusetts. And so our first um, task, our first year this year will be focused, and now you can see why I care a lot about my research, right? The, doing this instead of doing academic administration. We'll be working with the families of those officers to uh, better understand their whole lives, right? Not just the, the, the suicide and not just their occupational history, but their life history and how the families perceived their um, trajectory through their careers. And that includes spouses, uh, children, in many cases, uh, adult children, we won't be allowed to talk to children, children, but adult children, parents, that sort of thing. And so we're doing focus groups in the first year. But we're using that to ask the officer, officer's families who they were most close to at work, right? In terms of who, were their, who was their supervisor, who did they work on shift with, and then we're gonna go find those folks and interview them and, run, and um, give them a bunch of wellness um, measures, have an interview along with some, some uh, 
sort of uh, scales and, and depression scales, post-traumatic stress disorder scales. Now, these are the people who would have worked most closely with those officers. And each of those people were asking to name five people. So we're doing a network sort of tree to look at whether the impacts of those suicides attenuates over relational distance, spatial distance, and time. And I'm not really sure even what, we're gonna, what we hypothesize around that, because one of the things we noticed was that there were um, the officers, almost all of them had a patch, and they were all different, but they all had initials, usually of, and when we asked what that was, it was the initials of an officer who had, who had committed suicide. And they often said that they didn't know the person, but they're wearing it in solidarity, right? And so it just became really clear to us that regardless of their relationship to the event or the officer, it was very, they were very cognizant of, of it and talked a lot about it. And so that's my, the, the newest project that I work on. And so in my scholarship, I like to think that I've had sort of three key things that have led me to where I am today. One is my education, and for that I thank my parents who gave me the opportunities and allowed me to go to school forever, <laughs> for a very long time to get a PhD. Um, my mentorship, my two key mentors, right? One was a woman who was my, my first mentor at Northeastern, the other was a man, both of whom invested unbelievable time in, in my success. And that's the thing I wanted to say is that mentorship is hard, right? So I have men a mentee now who works with me on all the correctional officer projects. He just finished his PhD at Northeastern and he's a lot of work, right? Like, and I think I, now I realize I was a lot of work. It's a lot of work to mentor someone in a way that allows them to sort of get ahead in their career and under, really fully understand the, the relationships you need, the networks you need to succeed in the field. And so mentorship is important. And then partnerships, and I think this is really key. Because I didn't come out of um, the field, right? I was one of those people who just went straight into academia. For me, I would not be able to do my research without partnership through the justice agencies that I work with, especially the Massachusetts Department of Correction, who have been really good to me, and especially in this correction officer work, because that's, for in obvious reasons, a core concern, right? They're losing a large um, percentage of their, or an, uh, unacceptable percentage of their workforce, right, to suicide. And so they're really concerned about why that is and what they can do to address it. And they're willing to face the criticism that they might get when they allow someone independent to come in and do the research, right? So they, we may find that there are things that they have done that could, they could have done differently. And so some of the questions when we wrote the proposal were around liability. Like what if this, and the legal office was very nervous about it for the Department of Corrections saying, what if they find that there's a trigger and that trigger was almost always at work, right? Like, I actually don't think that's going to be the case, but you could. And so they had to take a lot of chances. I've also partnered with uh, the Women's Prison Association. So I will say uh, that's the oldest um, women's prison organization in the country, um, based out of New York. And that was my first research partner, actually. So I, my early work was on women's incarceration. And that partnership with the Women's Prison Association really allowed me the entree into the world of, of prisons, which can be hard to penetrate for anyone who, who's not already part of that world. And then I partner locally with lots of the community facilities because my students all care about incarceration too, and they want to be able to get in and study incarceration. And so we make sure, I, I through doing projects with little, uh, lo not little, local facilities, it allows my students to understand the world of corrections and to get in the door to do the work that they, they want to do. And so I have lots of partnerships. And I'm going to switch gear for um, a minute and just quickly talk about how the field is changing. So I mentioned that uh, at my university, and this is still true, there are four women in a, in a department of 19 um, professors. And I'm going to show you a bunch of data that says that there's some promise in the future, right? And so um, I'll talk a little bit about what we know about the field of criminology and criminal justice um, in terms of, of the future of the education in this area, because that's mostly where my focus is. So this, this graph just depicts, um, through one of my uh, partnerships, I work with the Association of Doctoral Programs in Criminology and Criminal Justice. So there are 42 doctoral programs which offer a degree in criminology or criminal justice in the country. And we're all part of this collaborative group, which is great because we collect data together. We're very collaborative. We send each other students when they're a better fit somewhere else and those sorts of things. But we've also been collecting data since 1999. And here I just put the, since the past decade. But you can see that in 2006, 35% of the, of the professorate in criminology and criminal justice among these programs, which offer a doctorate, were women, right? So just 36%, so less than a, th um, a third, or just over a third, and two thirds were men. But in that same year, almost 60% of all doctoral students were women, right? And so, 
And that has maintained a fairly consistent pattern over the time. Again, this is across the, the programs that offer the degree just in criminology or criminal justice. And you can see how slow this pattern is going to be to change. But eventually, right, these are going to be the women who will lead the doctoral programs of the future. Um, we have still about 40%. We've seen a creep up of about 5% over the years. So that in 2015, 40% of the, of the doctoral faculty, um, the faculty in the doctoral programs are women. We also, uh, so I mean, this one I wanted to show because you can see it's not just in doctoral students. We also see um, more than half, 60% of all master's students in criminology and criminal justice are also women. So this is going to be a female-dominated field eventually as these women um, take roles of, uh, in, in agencies like all those that um, lots of folks here work for and then also in the academic realm. And again, you can just see the gender imbalance between the past, right? So this is why I consider the past of criminal justice, all the white men who need to retire, as we were just talking about earlier, and the, the young women who are coming up and um, becoming the faculty of the future. This one, I want you to maybe. And I, I don't think you can talk, I wanted to focus mostly on gender because I was addressing the, uh, a bunch of women, but you cannot talk about criminal justice without talking about race and the importance of representation of minorities in criminal justice. So this one just shows that we do worse in terms of race, right? Um, about 80% for a very long time, um, this just goes back again to 2007, of the criminal criminology and criminal justice faculty are um, white, right? So they're non-Latino um, whites. Whereas if you look at the students, you're seeing more like, again, 60%, and the, the red line is the master students in these um, departments and the gray line, the lower gray line is the doctoral students. This just depicts it a slightly different way. So again, here you see um, that the field is dominated by whites, but that the future is dominated by, a little, is a little more colorful, right? We see more representation of non-Latino blacks, of Latinos, um, a small Asian population, and then the other group, which captures where they, they can't classify as well, so I should mention that. Um, because students don't have to report on, on their race, ethnicity, if they don't want to. Uh, this one is just in the master's cohorts, and so I'm one, the reason I broke this out is to show that we actually do a lot better in master's programs and doctoral programs. So one of my goals as associate dean, is to, one of my key goals, is to in, um, increase the representation of minorities in our graduate programs at Northeastern, but especially in our doctoral programs. Because I think in the master's realm, we've made progress. We're still not where we need to be, but we're, we're doing better than we um, in that area than we are in doctoral programs, where you can see it's still, especially for the, in, in the category of African-American um, students in the programs, the numbers are low compared to what we would like to see. In turn, back to gender for a minute, I'd like to just point out that this is making a difference, and I, I'm, this is one of my favorite graphics, and it's not every woman in the Department of Justice, but I do like to show that many of our federal justice agencies are now led by women, um, including the Attorney General, obviously Loretta, Loretta Lynch, and the Deputy Attorney General of the United States are both women. Carol Mason is the Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Justice Programs, which uh, basically hands out most of the money that gets given out um, across the Justice Department. Uh, Vanita Gupta is the uh, Assistant Attorney General of the Civil Rights Division. She's very well known. She speaks all the time. Um, she's one of those people you can regularly see um, out there uh, talking about justice issues, especially around the race and policing um, issues that we're seeing today. The Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division, the Director of the National Institute of Justice, uh, also a woman, the Chair, it says the Chairman on the Department of Justice's website. I changed that to Chairperson because <laughs> she's not a Chairman, she's the Chairperson. Um, Patricia Wilson Smoot is the chairperson for the U.S. Parole Commission. Joy Frost directs the Office of Victims of Crime. Denise O'Donnell, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, which provides all the agencies with justice funding. And then the uh, Antitrust Division is also run by a, a woman who's an acting assistant attorney general. So this is not every one of them, but these are some of the major justice agencies in, at the federal level, um, and especially uh, Important, I think, is it really, in terms of who's leading the charge in justice in this country, these are the women um, who have sort of risen all the way to the top and are directing justice policy at the federal level through their um, 
through their uh, policy work, their advocacy work, but also through their funding of various things. Really quickly, and how close am I on time? Or, am I okay? Good, yeah, okay. We've got, we've got enough flexibility. Lunch will be okay. I just wanted to. Next Okay, so I, I'll talk a little bit about what I do in academic administration and place some plugs for what we're trying to do in this region as Northeastern. Um, so I am now an, an administrator. I focus on the graduate education at Northeastern in the social sciences and humanities. And I'll show you all the programs that we have in that area in Boston. Um, but over my career, I've sort of spent a lot of time thinking about criminology and criminal justice. Obviously, I work with that group, so I know every director of every doctoral program um, in the country. Uh, the group is the Association of Doctoral Programs in Criminology and Criminal Justice. So if anyone knows someone who wants to get a PhD in this area, just go to their website. All the programs are listed with all the contact. It's actually very, uh, really unique to criminology and criminal justice that we have this central repository for these things. And then more recently expanded out to social sciences and humanities. Um, in terms of academic leadership and, and administrative accomplishments, I have been nationally elected in the field to the, our discipline's major group, the American Society of Criminology. So I'm an executive count, one of 12 executive counselors there. And I like to say 11 of the 12 are women. Um, so yeah, right now we have a male president. So uh, incoming, the outgoing president is a woman. But 11 of the 12 executive counselors from around the country are women. Um, which I will say is a function of the Division on Women in Crime, which is a division within the, the, um, the larger organization, the American Society, have really worked hard to make sure that they get out the vote, that they get their, their um, members nominated for these key roles in the, it's in the uh, agent in the uh, organization, and that their, their nominees win those roles, right? And so we have really a dom really dominated um, board almost all women, and I'm currently the chair of the Division on Corrections and Sentencing. So in the area of corrections and sentencing, um, we have a board and I chair that board at the moment. Our doctoral program at Northeastern in, in criminology and criminal justice, I'm pretty proud of, is now ranked 12th, 12th in the country, which is, again, 12th of 42, which is not you know that great, except that our program started the year I got there, right, in 2005. So it's fairly, no, that's not why it's successful, though. It's just fairly new. And so to be ranked 12th in the country when you're up against schools like Florida State, Rutgers, um, University at Albany, which have been around for 40 plus years with doctoral programs. Um, we've moved fairly quickly up the ranks. And I, if they, this was in 2010 or 2011, and I bet if we were to, if they were to rank again, we would actually be higher than 12th at this at this point. Um, so I'm pretty proud of that. Um, these are our programs. I just wanted to talk briefly. So while I've always been focused on criminology and criminal justice, and we have both masters and doctoral programs. In the college, we have programs that span the social sciences and the humanities. So I've always been pretty engaged with all the social science programs because they're all um, pretty in, um, intricately related to each other. But of course, the humanities have been fairly new to me. Um, so we have some uh, master's programs and PhD programs in history and English um, and things like that. One of the big things about Northeastern, though, is it's a very global. It sees itself as a very global university. So Northeastern's always um, had a, its main campus in Boston, but we now have opened campuses all over, including Seattle, which is why both Erica and I are out here right now. We have some of our Seattle folks here as well, um, and so we have CSSH Seattle, and uh, in, in within our realm of social sciences and humanities, we're looking to. Uh, develop the next generation of security resilience leaders, policy leaders, criminal justice leaders, um, especially around the area of, of urban. So urban studies is a real core focus of our college. Most of our programs have um, urban studies as one of the things that they do well, especially in Boston. We're looking to expand that um, to Seattle. We also have campuses now in Charlotte, in uh, Silicon Valley, um, and then the new newest one will open in Toronto in addition um, to the ones we have around. Uh, all of our, our CSSH programs, we have three which are um, out here in, in Seattle or in the graduate campuses, so to speak. 
And each of those has a relationship to our School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs. Two are run directly out of that school. The other one is, um, is co-run co between the school and another unit, the political science department. And so we offer three different things in, in the Seattle um, area. One is our certificate in security and resilient studies, which Erica has been working on, which is how she met many of the people in this room through networking around um, sort of promoting this particular program. The other is our Master's in Urban Informatics, which is a, a program which I'll talk about, which takes sort of big data and cities and, and tries to think about ways in which we can better understand the city as a, as a place and space. And then our Master's of Public Administration, which is unique because um, f with the, from the other two in that it's fully online. So anyone anywhere in the country can, uh, can enroll in our Master's of Public Administration um, program, including in the Seattle market. And so what we're trying to do as a college, and this is really important because as we go forward, this is key to what we're trying to do. So Northeastern, as I mentioned right at the beginning of my talk, is known for its experiential model, right? So for our undergraduates, there's the co-op program, which is really the signature program of Northeastern. And what we're trying to do in CSSH is weave that experiential model through all of our programs, our master's programs and our PhD programs. So that would include doing things like getting co-op at the master's level, having students go out and work as part of their educational experience, adding, we already have some pretty vibrant internship programs going in the master's area, but also to do the experiential learning model in the doctoral programs, which will be unusual, right? And it's one of the key features that Northeastern's looking to do. And so what that means, one of the things I'm, I've done with this newest grant that I just got on CO Suicide is we are taking one of my PhD students, she's actually brand new, um, but she's interested in, in uh, correction officer wellness and stress, and she, I'm going to embed her at the Department of Correction. So f to facilitate our research, she, her, all of her um, assistantship time is going to be at the DOC and not at the university. So it's a way to sort of engage her with an organization, which we, we don't usually get to do when we just go in and collect our data and come back out. Right? So she will be collecting data for our project and for her own work, her own dissertation, but she'll also be helping the agency with some of their needs around research and data analysis where they don't have the capacity to do that themselves at the moment. Um, so it's part of what we're trying to do across all of our programs. Um, the three that are really in the Seattle market that I, I briefly mentioned, the Security and Resilience Studies program, um, prepare students to manage contemporary transnational risks through a systematic understanding of the factors that will allow us to prepare for, withstand, rapidly recover from natural, man-made, and malicious disruptive events. So right now what we have here is a, is a certificate program in Boston, I mean in Seattle. It's a four-course certificate, which anyone can take, um, but it stacks into some of our other degrees, including our fully online MPA. So we are, encourage people to sort of start with a certificate and then consider going into the MPA program. We hope to launch the, we have a full master's program in security and resilience on the Boston campus, and we hope to be able to, in, in the next year or two, couple of years, um, offer the MS degree out in the Seattle market as well, so you could get the full master's, so the graduate certificate could stack both into the MPA or the, um, the security resilience master's program. We have a master's in urban informatics. So at Northeastern, we, we pride ourselves on what we call our data analytics suite. So we have a real strength in network science and, and uh, big data analysis. And one of the programs, the program in the College of Social Science is an urban informatics program. And so what we do there is we take big data, mostly related to cities, and try to understand patterns in, the, in that data. Um, all different types of data. So we have people who look at cell phone data, right? All the way to data from, depart from agencies, right? Some d um, human resources departments, things like that. Um, so how do you uh, capture big data and answer some of the big questions that are being faced by cities? in the 21st century. And then our MPA is a very, uh, it's a traditional MPA program, it's nationally accredited, it's one of the few accredited programs, there are about 150 accredited programs um, in, the ma in public administration, Northeastern's is one of them. And so we've been able to sort of um, spread that out, um, take it fully online to allow people outside of the Boston market um, to engage with our program. And so I end with this final slide, that just uh, again, these are all the programs that we, that we have out in Boston. Um, but my role has really forced me, and what's really, what I really love about the, the role that I've taken on is it's forced me to think more broadly than I was, right? But also to interact with colleagues. It's amazing how many of the colleagues in these other units, including some of the humanities, who I would never would have thought about, are engaged in the same, same exact types of questions that I engage in. 
And so the main thing I'm, one of the things I um, found surprising is our history department is currently doing a whole project on the Harvard University, I mean the, uh, the Norfolk Prison debate team, which won, which beat the Harvard University debate team back, you may have heard about this, it was when Malcolm X was <laughs> imprisoned at Norfolk. And so they, it, the funny thing about that was someone told uh, one of the professors in history, oh, you, if you want to get into the Massachusetts prison, see Natasha. Uh, she can probably get you in. And so now we have this collaboration where both the state um, government in Massachusetts, which wants to sort of feature this as a historic moment, um, and the prison out at Norfolk are showcasing uh, the sort of Norfolk debate team, which is actually really world famous in, in historic ways um, for their capacity to beat the, uh, the Harvard debate team. And so partnering with the Department of History was something I never thought I would end up doing, because how does that relate to what I do? But we've partnered to put on this display at both the, uh, the state building and then at the prison to showcase the debate team and their successes. Um, and the same with English. Just the other day I met with an English student who really wants to talk about prison narratives and wants to go into prisons and talk to prisoners. And so as I engage in this work, I realize that you know people in, in the social sciences and humanities have many of the same interests and come at them from different angles in ways that when you're stuck in your own field, in your own sort of silo, it's easy to forget that there are other people who are concerned about the same core issues issues that you are. And so I'm trying to bridge the two, and again, it's early days yet, um, but so far I'm pretty happy with my decision to do both. Um, I will say that my mentors are what are, without question, the people I turn to when I make big life decisions. I don't turn to my my ex under any circumstances. I don't turn to my, but I also don't turn to my seven-year-old daughter or even my friends when I'm asked to do something professionally. I call Judy Hall, who was my professor in psychology back in the early 90s, and I call Todd Clear every time. And they are, without question, you know, the reason, and, and the thing Todd always tells me and the thing I try to do, even though it's hard, is he, to pay it forward and to mentor someone else in the way that I mentored you um, so that you can sort of pay that success forward. And so I invest an awful lot of time in, one of, in several of my mentees, but particularly in one. Um, because he's a young black male who came from Dorchester, which is the very worst part of the city of Boston. He now has a PhD, and he sort of defied all of the odds and is determined to make it. And so I love you know, supporting him and his work and what he does as well. And I think that that's a really important thing to do as well. Where you've gained from others um, in their willingness to give time, you give that time as well. And so I always make the time. I cancel meetings sometimes to meet with him, right? With meetings with important people because he needs the guidance and the mentorship as before he goes into a prison, for example, things like that. And so I hope that that, um, that this group realizes, and I will say in our faculty at Northeastern, and this is one thing that always strikes me um, among all of us who recently got tenure, that every single one of us had a very strong mentor. And when I look back at all my, co my seven colleagues who are now at other universities around the country and successful in the, at those universities, the thing that they didn't have was that strong mentor. So when I look at all my young colleagues, all of us were mentored by someone who had already made it in the field and was a big name in the field. And so I think that it's really important that you mentor, that you have a mentor who can help you you get to wherever you want to go, right? And so we were all in the research one realm. We all wanted to make it in the world of research and scholarship. And so we were, ended up being paired with them. But that is true to a person. And that's when I really realized how important mentoring is. I knew it was to me, but it really to make it in the field, um, to make a difference. And the reason I say that is you saw that the 40%, 60%, right? At Northeastern, it's still four and, and uh, four of 19, right? So 15 men, four women. So in the Research One universities, that, that number is not going to be nearly as generous, right, as it is in the, in the more broad landscape of all the universities. And so I still think there's a lot of uphill, uphill battles to, to be um, fought to make it in the Research One environment. And it is hard when you're balancing, I said to Erica the other day, just last night at dinner, that I literally waited to have a kid until I went up for tenure. So I could only have one kid. I mean, I could probably force another one if I really wanted. But I, you know, I had to make choices like that because I knew if I, ha if I had had that kid, and this is what we were talking about over dinner last night, if I had my daughter before I went up for tenure, I don't think I would have I made it. I really don't. I think that the pressures of work and the environment that I'm in would have meant that you couldn't, and it's just, it's not right, right? And I still think there needs to be systemic change. You should be able to balance your, your life and your work and still be able to get ahead. 
and not leave your leave your family behind. I'm I'm still learning that balance now. You know, I'm still trying to manage those two things. I do have a six year old now, and I will say that I've changed my my you know whole life around that in ways that I don't know that I would have gotten tenure at Northeastern if I had had her before that that time, which is really troubling to me and something I think that we need to think about because I, I, the women, the other women who are junior faculty as well had their kids after they, got, they went up for tenure and made that conscious decision, but it impacts so many other areas of your life, right? Like, so now I have an only child. I'm one of four children. And I often think about that. Like, I didn't expect to only have one child, right? And so, like I said, I could have another one probably, but I, it, the, you have to make choices sometimes that aren't fair and shouldn't be it shouldn't be the way it is, right? We should be able to balance those, those things. And so as a dean, one of the things I'm really fighting for is that ability to say, to, have, to be in a role in a position where we can make cha positive change around that, around expectations on, on how much people need to be working, right? And how much research needs to be published and written in order to get tenure, um, that sort of thing. So. Yeah, hopefully so. Okay, thank you. So, anyway, Natasha. Thank you.